Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the life and death of Evil Knievel. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll start with the background of Evil Knievel, and then I'll move to the mental health and personality factors. Robert Craig Knievel was born in Butte, Montana, on October 17, 1938. His parents would divorce in 1940 after they had a second child, a son named Nicholas. Knievel and his brother went to live with his paternal grandparents. When he was eight years old, he went to an auto daredevil show. This became an inspiration for him. Knievel would become a drill operator in a copper mine after dropping out of high school in 10th grade. He was eventually reassigned to drive an earth mover on the surface, but he was fired after he somehow managed to get the earth mover to do a wheelie and drove it into a power line. For several hours, the city of Butte went without electricity. Knievel became active in ski jumping and rodeos. He enlisted in the United States Army and joined the track team. He also made paratrooper jumps there. After he got out of the Army, he married a woman named Linda Joan Bork, they would eventually have four children. After playing hockey, starting a guide service, and hitchhiking to Washington, D.C. to raise awareness about the elk population, Knievel joined the motocross circuit. He broke his shoulder and collarbone in a motocross accident in 1962, so he started selling insurance. He did pretty well selling insurance, but the company would not promote him, so he quit. He moved to Washington State and opened a Honda motorcycle dealership when that failed, he went to work at a motorcycle shop. Knievel had this idea of developing his own motorcycle show. He promoted an event and drew a small crowd. He started looking for a sponsor so he could afford to have a larger show. A motorcycle distributor agreed to sponsor him, but they wanted him to change his name to Evil Knievel, spelled E-V-I-L. Knievel did not like this because he thought people might confuse him with the Hells Angels motorcycle gang, so he changed it to evil spelled E-V-E-L. There are other stories about how he came up with the name. One suggests that the police gave Knievel that name after one of his many times in custody. He was in trouble with the law a few times. Knievel had a successful show in 1966 in California, but during the next performance, he tried a new jump that did not go as planned. His motorcycle smashed him in the groin and catapulted him 15 feet into the air. This would spell the end for this particular daredevil show. After recovering in the hospital, he started a solo act and went from town to town. His trademark stunt became jumping over vehicles. He would keep adding more and more vehicles to his jumps every time he visited the same venue. So people would get excited. Some of them probably wanted to see when he would crash. Well, it didn't take long. On June 19, in Missoula, Montana, he attempted to jump over 12 cars in a van but he was not able to get the motorcycle up to a high enough speed. He broke his arm and several ribs. This particular crash caused his popularity to skyrocket. He kept jumping over an increasing number of vehicles. In 1967, during a show in Washington State, he crashed and suffered a concussion. 20 days later, he returned to that venue, determined to finish the show. This time he broke two ribs, a wrist, and a knee. On December 31, 1967, Knievel attempted the longest jump of his career, 141 feet, over the fountains at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. The resulting crash gave him a concussion, as well as several fractures, including his femur, pelvis, hip, wrist, and both ankles. He was in the hospital for about a month. Knievel would later claim that his motorcycle was traveling just a little too slowly as he hit the launch ramp. In May 1968, he broke his leg and foot trying to jump over 15 Ford Mustangs in Arizona. In August of that year, he broke his hip in Nevada after losing control during a landing. Knievel was injured many other times. He said he had 14 surgeries during his career and broke about 30 bones. He cautioned against believing the stories out there that suggest he broke hundreds of bones. Now, of course, Knievel also had successful jumps where he landed and did not crash. He was doing well financially at this point. For a long time, he wanted to jump over the Grand Canyon, but he couldn't get permission from the government, so he decided to try to jump across the Snake River Canyon. He had a rocket-powered cycle built for the attempt, 
It was called the X-2. A premature parachute deployment caused the X-2 to land in the canyon. Knievel sustained minor injuries. In May 1975, Knievel jumped over 13 buses in London. He crashed and had a number of injuries, including breaking his pelvis. He told the crowd, I will never, ever, ever jump again. I'm through. In October 1975, Knievel jumped again, this time over 14 buses in Ohio. This was the longest successful jump of his career, 133 feet. He announced his retirement again after this stunt. About a year later, Knievel jumped again, but this time the jump was restricted to seven buses. Knievel apologized to the crowd, even though the jump was successful. In January 1977, Knievel was planning on jumping over a tank full of sharks in Chicago, Illinois. During a rehearsal, he crashed, breaking his arms and injuring the cameraman. After this, Knievel retired from major performances. In the television show Happy Days, the character Fonzie tried to jump over a shark on a water skate. It was reported that this episode was inspired by Evil Knievel. This would lead to the phrase, jumping the shark, which came to mean using an ill-conceived stunt in an effort to bolster decreasing ratings. In October 1977, Knievel pled guilty to battery and received six months in jail after attacking his former press agent over a book that he felt mischaracterized him. Knievel beat the victim with an aluminum baseball bat, breaking his arm and wrist. The criminal behavior was devastating financially for Knievel. He lost a number of deals, including those with Harley Davidson and Ideal Toys. In 1981, Knievel would declare bankruptcy. Eventually, he was able to secure several endorsements again and made a bit of a comeback financially. In 1986, he was fined $200 in Missouri after being charged with soliciting an undercover policewoman for immoral purposes. Knievel separated from his wife in the early 1990s. In 1995, he was charged with battery after allegedly attacking his girlfriend, Crystal Kennedy. She declined to press charges. In 1997, Knievel and his wife officially divorced. In early 1999, he was having serious liver problems due to hepatitis C. Because of all the injuries he had sustained, he had several blood transfusions. He contracted this disease during one of those. He was told by the hospital he only had a few days to live. He was on his way home to die when the hospital called and said a potential liver donor just died in a motorcycle accident. Even though the irony in that occurrence should have been fatal by itself, a few days later, Knievel had the transplant and would live. In 1999, he married Crystal Kennedy. They would divorce in 2001. Kennedy filed a restraining order against him, but they somehow worked things out and lived together again. In 2005, Knievel was diagnosed with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This illness is terminal. He also had chronic pain from his lower back, would suffer two strokes, and developed diabetes. On November 30, 2007, Evil Knievel died. He was 69 years old. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. I'm not aware of any report indicating that Knievel had any type of official mental health diagnosis. It was reported he had difficulty regulating his intake of alcohol, but there's no way to know if that rose to the level of a disorder. As far as his personality, Knievel had a high level of openness to experience. He was creative, appeared to experience emotions intensely, and was adventurous. He was low in conscientiousness, impulsive, irresponsible, and not cautious, although he had a phenomenal work ethic. He had high extroversion. He was outgoing, assertive, and sensation-seeking. It would be hard to imagine how anyone could have a higher level of sensation-seeking than Evil Knievel. He had mid-range agreeableness. He valued competition over cooperation and would not likely be characterized as modest, but he was altruistic and straightforward. As far as neuroticism, his level was low. Even though he had fear, it didn't prevent him from doing what he wanted. He did seem to have some anger management issues, though. I think what really strikes me about Knievel as far as this trait is how he would talk about death as if it was really no big deal. He was very matter-of-fact. He didn't seem to really worry about it. Even though Knievel had some trouble with the law and difficulty controlling his temper, I generally think of him as a pro-social sensation seeker. He liked excitement, but generally wanted to experience those thrills within the bounds of the law. 
Knievel really wanted to have a larger-than-life persona, and he had some interesting beliefs. He said, I love the thrill, the money, the whole macho thing. All those things made me evil Knievel. He said he wanted to live in the sunlight. He didn't want to have a regular job. He maintained a positive attitude. He thought it was important to be man enough to handle the circumstances when things don't go well. He said that a man can fall many times, but he's only a failure when he refuses to get up. Knievel believed in keeping his word. He made a few jumps where he knew it was unlikely that he would succeed, but he did it because he said he would. Even though he drank excessively, he did not like other drugs. He would say that narcotics were like nitrous oxide. They may help increase performance for a short time, but after that, everything gets blown to hell. What I really liked about his anti-drug message was this. It wasn't judgmental. It was really about consequences. He didn't say that drugs were bad, exactly. He said that if you're going to do them, you need to understand what's going to happen. So again, very pragmatic and straightforward. He was also a believer in wearing a motorcycle helmet. I think many people think of Knievel as inspiring what had to be thousands of bicycle accents as boys who watched him on TV would go out and try to recreate his stunts on a dirt bike. But in reality, his endorsement of wearing a helmet probably saved many lives. I think Knievel accomplished his goal of being larger than life. He gave new meaning to the term cheated death. It's amazing that he survived all those crashes. It really defies logic. He's an interesting character in that he did a lot of things that were not wise, and it was extremely costly to him. He suffered a great deal of physical pain for many years. But at the same time, it's hard to think of Knievel as a failure. It's difficult to watch the many interviews of him and not smile at his direct and fearless demeanor. He really was one of a kind. I don't recall ever seeing an interview where he made any type of notable complaint about his suffering. He did all these stunts knowing the risk, and he was willing to accept the consequences. He lived his life, for the most part, on his terms. He loved the excitement and was able to enjoy a great deal of that. In a sense, he became a folk hero because of this behavior. One of the comments that I see on just about every YouTube video that features Evo Knievel is when men were men. He certainly did tap into the idea of masculinity taken to an extreme. Evo Knievel made John Rambo look like Jar Jar Binks. I think there are a few lessons that can be learned from Evo Knievel. I'll cover three here. Number one, taking responsibility means accepting consequences without complaint. Number two, responding to fear isn't always a bad thing. It can help people avoid terrible consequences. Number three, every person is flawed, even childhood heroes. There is no such thing as the good without the bad. There is no perfect role model. Those are my thoughts on Evil Knievel. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.